Hi, it's Chris Leon here. I'm a PhD student in digital media at Georgia Tech. This is a presentation on arcade style game design. Now for context, this has been adapted and updated from my Georgia Tech master's thesis in digital media from May 2012, titled Arcade Style Game Design, Post-War Pinball, and the Golden Age of Coin-Op Video Games. This is the forum presented at the History of Games Conference in Montreal, Canada in June 2013, and I've received specific permission to be able to represent this online. The original thesis advisor was Dr. Ian Bogost, and on my committee were Dr. Brian McGurko, Dr. Celia Pierce, Dr. John Sharp, and Steve Swink of Enemy Airship. When I first got interested in game studies, some years before I even came back to graduate school, it seemed like there were a few different distinctive camps and ways that people within humanities studied game design and game history. One of the most prominent of those camps is that which studies it in the history and traditions of board games, card games, games like Dungeons and Dragons. These sort of tabletop game traditions are specifically uh, set aside from the other categories I'll talk about in that they're games of decision, and so when I make a choice to move a knight to a certain position or to play a certain hand, they're executed with 100% accuracy. You know, I, I don't make an error of overshooting or undershooting with my knight. I don't mean to play a hand and accidentally play some other hand in poker. And when there is a probability, it's typically either pure randomness, in the case of, say, rolling a die, or at the very least, it can be calculated, like in the case of poker hands. In the case of sports, on uh, sort of the line of philosophy of sports, this is another camp in which humanities sort of contextualized and understood games. These often looked at human athleticism, at matters of uh, sportsmanship, competition between players, and um, performance at a physical aspect of... In these types of games, strategy was maybe less of a role, at the very least, unless you're at a very, very high level of performance, um, than, say, in chess. And in this case, the goal is often very clear. You want to you shoot the goal. Uh, in the case of golf, you want to get the ball into the hole with as few strokes as possible. This is the sort of environment where, uh, so Bernard Sweets uh, wrote about lucery attitude, and that applies to both golf and to board games as well. Uh, but it's the example he uses is golf in that he says that there's more ways that we can move a golf ball besides using this golf club. And what means that makes it playing a game for us is partly that we opt to use this inefficient means, trying to use a golf club to hit the ball, as opposed to just picking it up and dropping it into the hole. And we'll get back to more of that in a moment. The sort of third category for game studies in the humanities seemed to be the, the cinematic or narrative track. And this could be textual in the case of an old game like Zork, could be truly cinematic in the case like Heavy Rain, the traditional sense, could be very, just very character and role-playing focused like we see in RPGs, or in the case of Myst, where it's sort of the creation of a, a narratively coherent universe. Now I want to be clear, because sometimes people get the wrong idea when I talk about things from this, this opening. All of these frames are perfectly good, worthwhile, valid, totally legit. I'm not trying to start a fight with anybody. Uh, all of these highlight different aspects that are entirely applicable to certain genres of games and varying degrees in other genres of games and have been very fruitful lines of research and I um, fully believe will continue to go on. But what troubled me about those being the main sources of, or angles on research, is that they, they sort of excluded or downplayed the significance of the types of games that I, I particularly like to play growing up. So these are games like Berserk, Qbert, Burger Time, Defender, Pac-Man, or Joust being the ones shown here. And other games in this category include Donkey Kong, uh, Miss Pac-Man, Space Invaders, uh, Gallagher, Galaxian. These are games which were coin-operated, played in arcades. Um, and there's a lot of weird ways that, you know, compared to those other games, they don't really stack up in the same criteria. So in terms of strategy, they're not poker and they're not chess. In terms of uh, performance, um, you know, unlike a sport, most of these are single-player games, or if they were two-player, in some cases you'd have to take turns. There was no element there of physical athleticism and coordination in the same way that it appears, at least in sports. And then lastly, in terms of story, uh, of course, these types of games often leave something to be desired in the story category in that they're either very cliche in the space-based games or sort of super absurd in the case of games like Burger Time, Qbert, Pac-Man, Joust, uh, even Mario Brothers. And so some of those highlights, again, that these are, these are games of skill, not strategy. So um, it's more about performance of the, the ability as opposed to making just the right decision of the objective like you might in chess. But randomness here is largely a factor of sloppy timing. So while randomness occasionally be a factor in artificial intelligence, a lot of the say I was actually rel relatively predictable, um, rather mechanical, if you will. And the difficulty was that you needed to jump a little bit later or a little bit sooner to get over the barrel in Donkey Kong or you should have fired a little bit earlier or a little bit later to hit your target without getting caught in Space Invaders. These are not context of physical dexterity. So in a game like baseball or boxing, uh, someone might spend many years with a coach 
on mastering that movement to be able to perform the move to, to get the ball where they mean to or to be able to deliver an effective and energy efficient punch. And those aren't really part of how these kind of games get played. They rarely uh, are direct contests. They're often, you know, say one player. And again, in the case of games that are two player, many of these games worked just as well if it was a single player experience. The story is either cliche, nonsensical, or only visibly suggested by cabinet art, which I'll show an example of here in a moment. So this is Breakout. And, you know, I think all of you have probably seen some variation of this over the years. Uh, you've got a paddle at the bottom, bouncing a ball against bricks on the top, chipping away at them until they're all removed, at which point they come back. This is an extremely abstract game, visually and in terms of gameplay objectives. But if you look at the cabinet art for the original Breakout, it's presented as Jailbreak. And there's no indication in the game itself that jail is involved, but you can see there clearly on the top of the back glass um, for this cabinet, Breakout uh, had a prisoner in it. Super Breakout for the arcade machine was also brick-based, but Super Breakout on the Atari 2600 happened to be based on space travel and included a weird story in the manual about traveling at light speed uh, through the cosmos when you appear a rainbow-colored force field you have to overcome to continue advancement and all kinds of weird story going on for this fundamentally very abstract game. They're kind of stretching or doing, having some weird effect. And so these games are weird. Um, I, and what I want to clarify is it doesn't make them bad. They're just weird compared to, say, those other games in the ways that those other games are measured. And so this led me to suspect something else might be going on. And what can help highlight this is if we look at what these games have in common with one another. They tend to be played for high replay value. Uh, this is, of course, an artifact partly of being in an arcade setting, but there's something that's meant to be played again and again and again. And so we might look at a game like Tetris, and even though it doesn't have hours of sequential content in the way a modern video game might, someone could still play it for hours, even though they're really playing on the same board again and again. And it all happens, for the most part, on one board. And there's a few exceptions as these games get further along, so uh, Donkey Kong has maybe four boards or so that repeat. Uh, but it's not fundamentally a game of, I want to get to the next stage, then the stage after that. They are extremely hard. Uh, by design, you lose in minutes. Some of these games, people will lose a life within the first 30 seconds to a minute. If you're doing poorly, you can lose very, very fast. And if you're doing well, you can get a lot more time out of it. It always ends with losing in some sense. What I mean by that is, other than skills, other than kill screens, which is when the game crashes from going through too many levels, and that being something that only really applies to extremely high-level world-class players for the most part, for everybody else out there, you played this game until you lost. It got harder and harder on you, and you got fewer and fewer lives, and eventually, the game would get the best of you, and it was over. But when that happened, you had some score, and so you weren't really losing in the sense of there's no other way to end the game. You were always winning to some varying degree based on what your score was when you lost. Good play earns prolonged play, and this is the other side of that fact that you tend to lose in minutes, and that's extremely hard. One of the main rewards given for playing the game more effectively is that you spent less money because you got more time per coin. Your achievement would often be rewarded with spectacle, with flashing lights, with um, loud sounds, with sort of playful sequences of entertainment in front of you, and that was a sort of a very visceral reward as a part of the game, the, the explosions, the lights, or the sounds uh, as part of the feedback in a way that maybe doesn't happen as much in board and card games. Um, and in some way even closer to what we might expect in sport with a spectacle of a well-performed move earning an ovation. And lastly, that they're a game of prediction, not reaction. And that's something that I'm going to use a quote from here in a second, but actually first let's focus again on that rewards as a spectacle. There's something else I want to say about that. In the documentary Tilt, which you'll be seeing a few excerpts from because it has a great series of interviews in the extras, the pinball designer George Gomez explains it thusly, Everything in the game is designed to reward the player the further he gets into the game making him feel like a hero. It should be going crazy with the lights, the music should come up, all those things should be giving feedback to the player that, wow, look what I just did. So like when they're doing these kind of games, they're building those cheering fans into it in such a way that, uh, you know, if you're playing a sport and you did well, people would cheer for you. In this case, the game acknowledges it with sort of the game cheering. And part of what's weird about this is that you don't even have to understand exactly what it is you did right. You could be just kind of hammering buttons or moving the joystick around, and occasionally you're going to be rewarded, and as a little kid, you can still enjoy the machine freaking out as you just sort of fool around with it, even without really understanding the points or the rules per se, uh, other than just how to keep the ball or the game in play. Game of Prediction, Not Reaction. That's a term from the book Pinball Wizardry by uh, Robert Palin and Michael Rain, and in it they explain that due to the high speed achieved by a steel ball on maxed wood, with bursts as fast as 4 meters per second during normal play, relative to the dimensions of the playfield, Reaction time is insufficient to wait until an event is happening to respond to it. The terms that Poland and Rain used to refer to this is that saying that pinball is a game of prediction, not reaction. And likewise, an Asteroids player can't wait until the collision is about to happen before beginning to dodge. Uh, 
You've got to be playing one step ahead, reacting before something even happens that you're really reacting to. And that's sort of fundamental to the way that these games get played. And, of course, you know, as you've seen from my original title from this, and as you probably know from just being familiar with my kind of work, uh, Pinball has a lot of things in common with these early coin-op games of those sort of varieties I was talking about. Uh, there's surprisingly little academic scholarship related to pinball, or at least the gameplay design of pinball, and we've got some early examples or other exceptions. So Turkle, Sherry Turkle, uh, always ahead of her time, referred to pinball in 1984 in video games and computing holding power as the godfather of video games. And that's a reference which, uh, you know, she actually sort of uh, glazes over pretty quickly the similarities in these games to instead focus on the differences to explain how video games aren't constrained by physics and material realities in the way that pinball is, and that gives them all kinds of more versatility for creating a wider variety of games, which is, she's absolutely correct about, and it's part of why they maybe left them behind. In 2008, Professor Stephen Jacobs and Christopher Egert uh, used Future Pinball, a, a digital pinball game where you can design your own tables, as a level design exercise in a game history course. Uh, and so again, like these things are, they are finding their way in game studies, they are discussed, uh, but for the most part, the material available on pinball isn't really coming from academic scholarships or sources. A lot of it's coming from collectors, enthusiasts, repair people, people that just sort of know this industry inside and out, from, and even sort of the developers themselves in linked the interviews. Now, a couple summers ago, I was out at the uh, Pacific Pinball Museum in Almeda, and I noticed that when it's uh, some of the older machines, say from the 50s, uh, they had balls that would show you how many balls you had lost. And these older machines, unlike the newer ones that recycle the same balls for each play, uh, these would have one ball per play, and as you lost them, they'd stack up. And this reminded me a bit of, you know, we've got um, in Defender in the bottom right, Pac-Man in the top right, Dig Dug in the top left, and uh, Jumpman's, this is of course before he was known as Mario, in the bottom left. Uh, sort of this way that we get this weird expression of how many ships, how many, how many jump men, how many dig dugs you have left, and sort of the inverse indication of how many you've lost instead of how many you have remaining. But there's these little conventions that sort of in weird ways connect to each other in ways that they don't really connect again as directly to, say, sports or to card games or to games that are sort of strictly narrative. And speaking of narrative, this separation of these elements sort of reminds us to th that these games kind of propose immersion in a different way than newer games do. Um, this very notion that there's multiple Jumpmen, multiple Dig Dugs, multiple Pac-Mans means we're maybe not looking at it so much as I'm that character, uh, so much as I'm here and Pac-Man's on the screen, or I'm here and Dig Dug's on the screen. In another interview from Tilt, uh, pinball business person uh, asked Steve Ritchie, So, Steve, I'm trying to understand. Am I the ball? And it's a fascinating question, because... You know, in pinball, there's lots of things happening on the table, but it's not really clear to refer to yourself as the ball, or if you're the flippers, or, or what your essence is there, and it's, it's fundamentally a different thing going on, and I think that in the same way when we're playing these other games, even though we're in control of Pac-Man, we don't necessarily think of ourselves as Pac-Man so much as wanting Pac-Man to do well and trying to steer him out of trouble, as the case might be. The initial uh, thing, though, that tipped me off to even be looking for these connections was Stephen Kent's uh, very important book, The First Quarter, in which he, he mentions that pinball... He kind of devotes the whole first chapter to pinball's business relationship and connections and momentum going into helping to establish video game culture. And the way he referred to it is that pinball helped people grasp video games, much like calling a car a horseless carriage uh, helped people really understand what role it played in civilization. You know, they didn't just see this monstrous machine and figure, what is that? They're like, okay, that's like a carriage minus the horse, and help people understand it. The companies and the people, I think, really revealed a lot more about uh, overlap between these some of these older arcade games, uh, for example, Larry, Eugene Jarvis and Larry DeMar, uh, they worked on pinball before and after they worked on video games. But the video games they worked on include Defender and Robotron 2084, both really classic, important games from that era. Gottlieb, a company otherwise known for most of its company time for making pinball machines, is responsible actually for Qbert. And in fact, there was a sound chip in Qbert that Steve Ken points out uh, was a reconfigured audio chip from a pinball machine. And that when Qbert falls off the edge of the platform, it uses a knocker, the loud mechanical pop that's done in uh, pinball machines to acknowledge a high score or to acknowledge an extra replay. Stern, a family which uh, later got into a long chain of pinball machines and initially was a reacquisition of Chicago coin that was renamed, created the game Berserk. Uh, it's shown here on the top left, which is a game that, if I'm not mistaken, has led to at least two people having heart attacks and high score competitions, earning it some kind of unsavory award. George Gomez, designer for uh, Spy Hunter, and he was working on the original Tron game. Uh, he's also worked on pinball machines as well and continues to do so to this day. 
Uh, and Stephen Kent even point out that Toru Iwatani, who created Pac-Man, was a pinball enthusiast and really kind of wanted to make pinball machines. But Namco Japan, when Toru worked there, uh, didn't make pinball machines, and so he instead had to work on Pac-Man. And part of what makes this interesting is that if you've got someone who's a pinball enthusiast, and you have a game where what sets its gameplay apart from other games is these sort of dynamics of covering through all the lanes, it kind of is in some ways reflective of maybe rollover lanes from pinball. Or this notion of power pills switching the functionality and causing enemies to flash of how many points you get from collision or what the effect of it is, is a little bit like Special One Lit, another feature common in pinball games where when you actuate certain features on a playfield, the relationship between other features on the playfield can change. So I'm not saying he made those specific connections so much as when you have pinball enthusiasts or pinball programmers or pinball designers also going on and off from working on video games, I think it's not uncommon to, or not unrealistic to expect they may have some similar gameplay concepts in mind. One of the uh, more curious cases from this is Ed Boon of Midway fame, and he went on to help found uh, or kick off uh, the Mortal Kombat series, and includes uh, he performs his own voice acting for Scorpion in the game, saying things like, get over here. But before he did that, he was the voice of Rudy in Funhouse, this classic early 90s pinball game in which you have a little dummy in the machine, uh, and this is partly because he was a pinball programmer before he wound up making video games. And so, you know, you might be wondering, okay, well, why do I give a flip? I mean, this is all kind of curious, but uh, there's concepts that pinball designers talk about and have studied and worked on and mastered for generations now that I think apply to helping us understand these arcade video games in a new and different light. So, for example, one of the concepts, also from documentary footage, uh, extras from Tilt, is pinball designer Pat Lawler referring to the importance of designing for near miss. Near miss refers to this effect where, as he explains it, the player can say, I meant to do that, after they try to do something and they fail at it, but something else cool will happen instead. So if they miss a ramp, it should achieve an orbit. If they miss the target they're shooting for, it should hit a different target. And especially in these early video games, like Space Invaders, Asteroids, Centipede, and Robotron, in many cases, you're firing into a crowd that early on in the level, it's hard to miss. You're shooting for something, you hit something else, you can still kind of play it off like you meant to, and that often works out just fine. And you got to remember for context that these games are played in public. Both pinball and these video games were designed not to be played in the security of your home or the isolation of your home, but where other people might be watching you, strangers or friends alike. And it actually can help save some face to be able to have a situation where, no matter what you do, at least for a while, it looks like you really know what you're doing. And as the game gets harder as it moves on, you get a smaller crowd in these kind of cases for these games, and it suddenly becomes harder, and it matters if you can't hit that last Space Invader always speeding up to come get you. Digging more into the company associations, and again, some of these are from Kent, uh, I found out that Atari, Data East, who made Burger Time, Sega, Capcom, and Taito all have also worked on pinball machines. And so, while there were other coin-op EM games before pinball, absolutely, including shockers and grip testers and mechanical dioramas and fortune tellers, like from the movie Big, by the 1950s, almost all those except for pinball were drying up. And maybe more importantly to my case, uh, many of those did not come from the same companies as, say, these later game companies did, and that their mechanics didn't really fit into this arcade game pattern I've been referring to of playing well to prolong play, or trying to get a high score, or having button-based input. They all kind of worked on very different novelty principles than, than the ones in pinball that we still see in these early arcade coin-op games. Uh, pinball, just for a bit of brief background history on where it comes from, since uh, you know I, I suspect a lot of my listeners or readers are familiar with video game history pretty thoroughly, but maybe less so for the history of pinball, this actually dates back to, to lawn bowling, when you would much like in a modern bowling situation, uh, roll a ball on the ground to knock over pins. Now, uh, nobility had the luxury of having uh, uh, well-kept grounds and smooth and short-cut grass and all these sort of things that would enable this game to, to, to make sense for them. But for the poor people, people who were just playing games and you know, didn't have so much land or didn't have such well-kept land, uh, they'd make indoor variations of these games. And so that's actually part of the descendants of, say, a game like pool or billiards, and at least as the myth goes, uh, so the story goes, and I have no clear confirmation on either way I've been able to nail down, that's why the green uh, felt is used on pinball on pool tables to reflect the color of the grass, to reflect that these were once lawn games. Uh, on the bottom right, we see one of the variations of Bagatelle, which in the early days was a modification in the same vein of lawn bowling brought into a table form, where instead of shooting at pool balls like you might in billiards, you're instead shooting into these holes to try to score it into pockets or knock over pins. And Bagatelle is an extremely old game. Bagatelle dates back to between the 1500s and 1700s, was originally played frequently in France. But as you can see here, this is actually an old picture from a newspaper of Abraham Lincoln playing Bagatelle. Uh, it's got a long history to it. Now these are some of the uh, some examples of real Bagatelle boards. On the left we can see uh, 
Uh, actually, these aren't just Bagatelle, these are Parlor Bagatelle. So there's an important difference between the kind of game we saw Lincoln playing in this previous slide, where he's shooting directly at pockets, and these types of games, where instead, what you see on the right side is a gutter. So if you look at the picture on the left, um, there's a cue stick on the left side that has a big fat head on it. That's called a mace. You'd use that to basically shove the ball, the pool ball, up the side of that right gutter. It would hit that arc, roll back down through these pins like a pachinko machine, and then land in one of these pockets down below, and that was your... That was where the ball ended up, that was your score. And on the right side, we see the the uh, the thumb plunger, where you'd pull it back with one hand, let go, and a spring-loaded plunger would knock the ball up into the ramp, it would fall into a scoring pocket, you'd shoot multiple balls to accumulate a score. Uh, and this was supposed to be a more casual game, with more randomness to it, than the target shooting, which made it better for players who were maybe less experienced to still kind of get involved with playing it. Now, these steel pins nailed into the board are why it's typically referred to as pinball. Uh, I tend to refer to these as bagatelles or parlor bagatelles to help distinguish them from the games that have flippers, which in the modern world we tend to associate pinball with implying the game had powered flippers, which actually doesn't begin until 1947. Now, the gameplay, even though those games have been around since the 1500s, 1700s, and so on, and parlor bagatelle may be on the later end of that, those weren't really commercialized yet as a coin-op industry, as a mass-produced industry of, of standalone games, until the Great Depression struck. And so this has actually happened in around early 1930s, when people didn't have the kind of money they used to, and so they needed a cheaper way to play games. The people who helped start off this business as an industry were uh, primarily David Gottlieb and Harry Williams. And these two people, who, who were rough, roughly in competition with each other, both had a bit of a background in carnival games and their maintenance and upkeep and... Um, operating them or playing them and so on, and and what they recognize is the deal, this is a point made by Roger Sharp in the book, uh, Pinball Exclamation Point, is that, okay, so for these normal carnival, carnival games, you have to pay someone to sit there on a stool and do a bunch of functions to administer the game. They've got to, they've got to coax people and entice them to come play. They've got to accept their payment, and when you get their payment, hand them the balls or the darts to throw at the bottles or the balloons or whatever. Uh, you then have to keep them from cheating, keep them from crossing the line, keep them from stealing the prizes. And when they do achieve what they should, you're supposed to acknowledge their success or, or taunt them or coax them on or give them the prize. Uh, and these are all functions that, if you could internalize into the functionality of the machine, so instead of having a person do these things, the machine did it all by itself, then you wouldn't have to pay someone to sit there. And if you don't have to pay someone to sit there, you can charge less per play to let people play this game. And that means that you can charge a penny per play and still pay off this machine in a matter of weeks. And so suddenly we had a game that people within the Depression era could play because they were able to automate so many of these carnival functions of acknowledging success or calling people into play, attracting them rather to play it, giving them balls for payment, keeping them from cheating, and so on. And it was a one-time cost to the buyer to buy a pinball machine, which back then might have cost them, say, $16, $18, which accounting for inflation since 1930 is actually about 200 250 modern-day dollars, uh, in U.S. dollars at least. But they could still, like I say, pay it off in a matter of weeks just for people paying a penny for five balls at a time. Now, the other important reason why, uh, out of all the types of carnival games someone might adopt, Parlor Bagatelle was an especially good fit for this type of game is because of the simplicity of playing it. So if we look at an old game like Monopoly, or in fact almost any board game, there's a long, rich cultural tradition of players having to explain to each other how to play. Um, some of this is pointed out in uh, Ludica's Homogeny of Play. And... Uh, this also applies to sports, where maybe we're less likely to read the explicit instructions for sports, but we still expect to be coached or taught by our friends how to participate in it. And this is important because in those games, there's so many things you could do, physically speaking, that you're not allowed to, in terms of how the pieces are moved, or in terms of how your body is used in a sport. Uh, you have to know what you could do that you're not allowed to, so you won't accidentally do it. However, in these games, especially when the introduction of flippers came along in late 40s and early 50s in the modern configuration, there was a button to push. And this button allowed you to only perform actions you were allowed to do in the game. And so this actually helps remove that Bernard Sweet's illusory attitude from the grasshopper that I mentioned early on about the golf club, where within sports and board games, you have to be conscientious about what you're not allowed to do so you don't accidentally do it. In the case of pinball, and any of these sort of button-based games, you're allowed to do anything you can do with the buttons, more or less. And so you don't have to worry about uh, accidentally doing the wrong thing, which doesn't make sense or is unfair or cheating for the game, so much as you just have to be able to push the buttons. And of course, there's other ways that these games have uh, adapted to prevent cheating, uh, the tilt mechanisms, and in fact, the legs are partly there to keep you from tipping it upside down, and uh, the weighted base, and all these sort of things played into the fact that they were originally maybe easier to cheat at and gradually became more difficult, including the tempered playfield glass, which keeps you from directly getting to the ball. Because short of smashing the tempered glass and moving the ball around by hand, it's actually more convenient to play the game by the flippers than it would be, like I say, to cheat, or in the case of like a Donkey Kong machine, 
trying to crack open the cabinet and solder modifications on the circuit board is actually less convenient than just playing the game with the buttons and the joystick. The other thing to note is that uh, Michael Leba's computer solitaire versus non-computer solitaire example in There's No Magic Circle on the difference between computer games and traditional games helps point out that in the digitization and the automation of rules, uh, we can learn how a game works by the process of playing it. We can use playing as a way to probe it. I think Karen Seidman made the same example in a 2000 address uh, referenced in Rules of Play um, by Salem Zimmerman. But it's this way that you don't actually have to understand everything there is to know about the game. All you have to know is, okay, what am I allowed to do and what am I trying to not do? And in the case of, like, say, pinball, I know I can push these buttons and I can use the plunger and I need to keep the ball in the play field. And beyond that, you can, through the process of playing, learn how the different play field elements behave together or learn how many points they're worth through the process of trying them out and scoring them in different orders in the same way for playing Joust or Asteroids or whatever, you partly, part of the act of playing is probing that world to learn how it works once you just know the inputs and what you're trying to avoid. This is Humpty Dumpty. This is 1948. This is the first play field that had flippers on it, and you might not be seeing them because you're probably looking for them in the wrong place. There's six of them, and they're here, and they're facing sort of backwards and upside down by relative modern standards. They swung in a little bit, and it would help knock the ball in. This is actually an accidental invention by attempting to make reactive bumpers that would push the ball and the ball hit into them and you decide to make it uh, say he Harry Mavs decided to make it uh, hand controlled instead now for Humpty Dumpty the theme uh, we can see on the back glass here has some women in bikinis and it's got a knight or it's got a king uh, there's some weirdness about this but one of the things I want to point out though is that the uh, uh, we've got score on both sides of lights these weren't reels yet these were just lighting up which score you had achieved uh, the other thing to note about this is you don't actually see a Humpty Dumpty on that back glass. However, it turns out there's a Humpty Dumpty who's sort of behind a cookie cutter light that in a dark enough room or while the machine's plugged in, you can see a projection of Humpty Dumpty as he falls down the wall on the back glass. Now, something to note about these games is that uh, the play field didn't connect at all to the theme. And so we see here, this is the Humpty Dumpty play field up close. There's nothing down here that has to do with putting him back together again. There's nothing down here that has to do with knocking him off the wall. You're simply advancing bonus and scoring 50,000 points when lit, scoring 10,000 points when lit, and so on, uh, toggling and scoring points in a very abstract fashion. The other upside, though, to playing with these buttons is that it took out the physical fatigue, it took out the physical conditioning necessary to play traditionally reactive games. So it used to be that if you wanted to play a reactive game, um, football, soccer, tennis, your heart needed to be in shape, your lungs needed to be in shape, your legs needed to be in good shape, and people have to devote a lot of time and energy and effort to becoming in the right kind of condition to play these types of activities. Uh, remember when they were referring to games of performance skill as opposed to games of uh, strategic decision making like, say, chess or checkers or poker or whatnot. Uh, this also removes the role of fatigue and being able to limit how much you can play it, removes the risk of injury. And these are all valuable things if you think about the market role of an arcade machine it wants to have a broad audience. Skinny people can play it. Overweight people can play it. You can play it for hours on end without having in great shape. Uh, and so all these are things that help factor into the importance of playing a game with a button, which we take for granted now, of course, having grown up with them, that we can play video games with buttons. But for most of the history of humankind before pinball, button-based play was not very common. Another way to think about these buttons is to look at, uh, so like on the left side here, we have baseball. And in baseball, it's really important to swing the bat in a very particular good fashion, which again, batting coaches and professional athletes spend many years trying to hone and coach and perfect. Uh, because of the difficulty of performing that action correctly and ideally, in addition to timing the swinging of the action. If the, if the bat is swung very well, but too early or too late, then it doesn't actually work out to be that effective of a swing. If we look in the middle, we see tee ball, in which the ball is put up on a big tee, and the batter has to hit it, but there's no longer a timing aspect. They just have to master swinging and hitting a stationary target. On the right side, we see a classic baseball game on a video game system, and here, Every time you push the swing button, the bat swings exactly the same way. It's completely removed the necessity to know how to swing that bat masterfully, and is instead isolated out if you're swinging too early or too late. And so in a way, and this is a bit sloppy, but bear with me, you can sort of think of it as baseball minus t-ball equals the video game button. And that again, it automatically performs the swing for you and isolates down the issue to time. In the same way this happens with uh, pinball flippers, if they always behave exactly the same when pressed and released, that allows your mind to focus on the time instead of the execution of how much force you apply, or so on. Now, speaking of force, there's actually this curious dynamic here of, uh, of how these different buttons can be used in a semi-analog fashion. And so actually, I'm going to refer to this bottom diagram first. It's from an image of Game Feel, a uh, book by Steve Swink that I highly recommend. It's one of the examples of someone who's done research in uh, the types of games that are played in real time, as opposed to, again, the strategy-based kind of stuff.
And he uses the example of Super Mario Brothers, uh, which uses a mechanic that, say, Major Havoc did as well from Atari, where the longer you hold the jump button, the longer you stay in the air. And even though the button isn't pressure sensitive, people will sometimes get the impression that if you push the button harder, which translates to longer, you'll get a little bit higher up. And if you push the button very quickly, which translates in some ways to lighter, then the character doesn't go as high. As a physical product of how the flippers are put together, and on the top right we see a diagram from Marco Rossellini's complete pinball book, uh, what happens, uh, a lot of folks have the mistaken impression that a pinball flipper is somehow to do with the amount of force you apply to the button, and it really isn't. Pushing the button is completing an electrical circuit, which is actuating that solenoid coil, it's number five up there, pulls in the armature, which is number two, yanking the flipper, uh, which is connected through the board of the table up to where you see number eight marked, and that applies a force, an impulse, if you will, to yank the flipper up. And if you just tap the button very quickly, you can actually do a light flick of the ball kind of across to the other flipper. If you're holding up the flipper and you let go and then press it again, depending on how long you let that gap of time pass between releasing and hitting again, you can juggle the ball to different degrees back behind your flipper. And so we, again, in this type of game, almost as an accidental product or immersion product of the physical construction of the machine, achieve this semi-analog functionality based on time duration. Now, in terms of theme, in terms of what we might call playfully narrative, uh, original old pinball-type machines, which again, these are pre-flippers, so we might call them parlor bagatelles, uh, that were coin-op, but like Ballyhoo, many of them were simply abstract decorative designs to try to help lure the player in. Remember, this is one of the functions of the carnival barker, is to get people to come over and play the game if they're across the room. And this is in a very inviting and visually appeasing, visually pleasing pattern. Game from around the same time, and this is also an extremely influential early game in the industry. This is from David Gottlieb, the previous one from Harry Williams. Baffle Ball was a game which, if you look at the play field, resembles baseball fields. Like you can see, it's got a diamond, and it's got kind of a grassy color underneath it, and it's got kind of scoring points where the four bases are. But I want to point out that first base is actually worth more points here to get the ball in than third base. Do you notice that? On the right, it's worth, say, 350 points on the outside ring, to 250 on the left. And it's, of course, because the right side's harder to hit reliably using the plunger. But even though it resembled baseball, it in no way borrowed any rules or scoring from baseball. It simply tried to draw someone in the same way that a modern pinball machine might, say, allude to Lord of the Rings. And I might be like, well, I'm interested in Lord of the Rings, so I'm going to give this game a shot. Uh, whether or not the playfield, and as of course we'll discuss it later, will reflect any of those themes in their gameplay. Now, it wasn't long before clever pinball designers, and this is Playboy, also from, I believe, Gottlieb, uh, found ways to incorporate the playfield theme into the scoring. So in this case, there are playfield cards printed all over the board, and where your balls land help you form hands like you might in poker. And in this way, the game creates a much more interesting and complex scoring dynamic than if it just had numbered holes, like, say, many of the other parlor bagatelle type games did. And moreover, they didn't have to teach the player how that scoring happens, because players could be assumed coming into this to already know how to form different hands or what the different hands meant in poker. This went even further with uh, the automated scoring mechanism in a game called Bolo. This is actually our first passive bumpers. So before the introduction of this game, pinball scoring only happened from where the ball wound up. When the ball would end in a pocket, it was worth that many points. But for Bolo, these pins that you see on the board arranged like bowling pins, um, when hit, would trigger underneath the table to activate the light on the back glass to show you which of the 10 pins you've hit. You get exactly two shots, just like in bowling, to hit all 10 pins. And if you've already lit a pin because you've already hit it, it doesn't count to hit it again. And this is a very weird kind of scoring relationship, except for the fact that the bowling metaphor communicates clearly to players walking up to it what to expect from how it plays. And again, you can have this novel play that plays differently than the other parlor bagatelle games uh, without having to explain all the intricacies of if you've already hit a, hit a pin, it doesn't count, you have exactly two shots, you're trying to hit all ten pins, and so on. There were many different mechanisms that they tried to use to make these games less abstract, to make them less about just scoring points. And this is Jigsaw from the World's Fair. This is a 1934 game, which also is pre-flippers. And if you look on the right, you shoot the ball with a plunger, it swings all the way around the top and the bottom and then up off the right side, at which point it arcs into one of those holes. In the bottom half of the play floor, you see a puzzle is actually inaccessible to the ball. But when it hits those holes, it would use piano wire to then flip these puzzle pieces. So you're forming a jigsaw puzzle. It would actually flip the piece and all the pieces that are below it in the arrangement. And so the goal here is to try to land a ball into each of the top holes to, to solve the whole puzzle. And here we've got a visual representation providing a sense of progress that's separate from the actual abstract activity going on in the game. Uh, and there were other mechanisms or devices they used for this. So playfield toys became more popular in later pinball games. And what we see here is a game called, uh, I believe, Knockout or Knockdown. 
And uh, what we have here are little toy men on the field that are boxers, and the ball can't get into where they are. You can see they're surrounded safely by rubber, rubber bands, um, like the other pieces of the play field. But when you accomplish certain goals in this game, they would sort of animate for you in a miniature cutscene, where the boxer on the left side would hammer his uppercuts in, and the boxer on his right would fall into his back and then pop back up, and the referee would be sort of throwing his hand around, and it created a little cutscene to reward you for the fact that you're playing this game well and accomplishing something successfully in it. And part of what I find interesting about these is the way they kept these very abstract games, these fundamentally score-based, weird rule uh, games that, in, in you know, of course, they don't really resemble baseball or boxing or solving a puzzle, but they connected it to a visual metaphor in a way that taught people what to expect when they walked up to it of how to play it. And I think if we look at an old game like, say, Pong, uh, which, of course, doesn't strictly fit my definition of most of my coin-op stuff because it's this is a game which is ideally two-player and um, played with an analog input as opposed to buttons, but just as an example of abstraction um, brought in through the coin-op environments, here's a game where uh, it's not really like tennis, right? I mean, it's almost, as someone mentioned in the history of games, it's almost really more like air hockey, uh, but they just use this sort of crude metaphor for letting you understand, okay, well, I don't want the ball to pass me, or the point becomes theirs, and that's kind of enough to be able to play a game like this. And it helps me wonder, so for newer examples, like, say, NBA Jam, which, again, is well past the era of the coin-op era from, from Golden Age, how much is a game like NBA Jam really a simulation of basketball in any meaningful sense, as opposed to really kind of a fundamentally abstract game with very peculiar rules and interactions to it, which by using a, pin, or using a ba basketball metaphor helps immediately convey to players who are familiar with the game, okay, well, I need to control this piece to connect to that piece to be able to deliver the ball piece into the hole for the goal and how the scoring works and how the fouls work and so on. Uh, and it becomes a sort of this language so that you can assume certain knowledge from the player, and then let them figure out the details as they play. So this is the game Central Park. Uh, this is a backlash for it, and uh, one of the things that had that became an issue was that they had to keep selling new machines. So the way the arcade industry was structured was that people who sold machines didn't make money off the quarters that were put into them. People that sold machines made money on selling the machine, and then the quarter sales were all used to help recoup that investment from the operator or from the location owner if they owned it directly. And so a game like Central Park came along because they had actually sort of run out of sports metaphors, run out of other game metaphors to borrow from. And you can only release so many golf games, so many card games, so many uh, baseball-themed pinball games in a row before you've got to start resorting to other things. And we started getting weird other themes, these sort of genres like sci-fi in a very generic sense, or uh, Day at the Beach, or jet planes in a different sense. Uh, I guess actually prop planes and some of these older ones. And in Central Park here, it's like it's a nice day in the park. But if you look at the playfield, once again, we've actually, by this time, lost the scoring metaphor because it's less easy to connect to the rules than we say could say in a baseball or um, pool-based game uh, in terms of the theme. When you're working with a theme like a day in the park, you go back to having these abstract scores where you're building up a, a bonus and you're doubling it or you're lighting specials and you just get a very different kind of playfield that's back to being abstract in just numbers. This changed around in the 80s, and uh, it happened a little bit earlier in the 80s, too, with games like Black Hole. But Pat Lawler, uh, another interview from Tilt and the Extras, uh, refers to high speed as being a really ex important example of this, where in 1986, uh, a game by Steve Ritchie, uh, it really tells a story effectively. And the way that it did this, and so if we look at the upper play field of high speed, uh, you've got these traffic lights that you have to advance from green to yellow to red. Then you have to run the traffic light, so you run through the red light, setting off the siren on top of the machine, the police are then chasing, you have to escape the police by performing certain playfield objectives. And so here we had a theme which was, in addition to being the visual styling for the back glass, affecting a very core major feature of the gameplay in a way that wouldn't maybe make sense in other games, and clearly in this case was sort of partly derived from or inspired by that theme. And this helps people maybe understand this gameplay in a way that's less abstract. If we look at a game like uh, Missile Command, though, it helps us identify um, the sort of the, the, the way we think about the ending of these games. So in a game like High Speed, you could evade the police and you could do it repeatedly, but you never really lost in the sense of, like, the police caught you. And, like, the it sort of implies that a little bit in the back glass uh, lighting or the, 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 um, the messages it tells you and so on, but, but you never feel like you really lost at it. You just, you, like I say, you win to varying degrees based on your score. So a game like Missile Command... You know, it's, it's relatively endless, but what happens is uh, eventually the missiles will get you. Uh, but the, the trick is that you're supposed to play again. The game's not supposed to ever be over. Uh, 
Uh, these are not games that you're supposed to be able to complete and then move on from because you'd stop putting quarters in it. And at the same time, you're never supposed to accept your loss and move on with your life because, again, you'd stop putting quarters in it. So the loss, in a way, becomes non-diegetic. It's not like when a character dies in a cutscene. It's not like when a character dies in a game, um, sort of as a, as a planned sequence for, for narrative reasons. In these cases, the loss was sort of you're supposed to shrug it off and sort of, well, okay, well, let me, let me go back into the battle. And it's really stuck in this isolated moment, this sort of static climax of the story where the, the situation is kind of assumed or cliche or in some cases, like I say, arbitrary. Uh, the ending never really happens. Um, positive never happens and negative doesn't really count. And you're sort of cyclically stuck in this action of like, this is a game about fighting the Russians. This isn't a game about losing to the Russians. It's not about the inevitability of the enemy winning. It's about the action of fighting off the bad guys. Now, if you look back at the high-speed playfield, the other thing to notice about this playfield is that there's all kinds of parts in here to score that have nothing to do with that narrative theme of running from the police. So if we look at the bumpers in the back, a classical part of almost every playfield for many, many years, uh, ever since that 1936 Bolo or 1930s whatever Bolo game introduced them, uh, you could score by bump bumping the ball around back in those, and uh, it didn't simulate a car wreck. It didn't simulate something that narratively made sense. It was it was just accumulating points. And this seems a little weird alongside the like narratively suggested central core theme, but this actually helps remind us about things like coins in Mario. So did you ever ask yourself why in the heck is Mario collecting coins? Is he poor? Is he trying to collect something to buy something for Peach? Uh, you know, what's going on here? In the world's in danger, the kingdom is in trouble, uh, his, his princess is kidnapped, but he's collecting coins. And I think what these are really doing is sort of a carryover from the other parts of the pinball machine, which didn't strictly fit the narrative and didn't even really try. They're just trying to communicate to you, get these. These are good for you to get and that these will... Um, they just become a part of the gameplay, even though they're separated from the narrative. The same thing happens for Fruits and Pac-Man or other curious scoring items that just show up in games, Rings and Sonic and so on. They serve some other purpose of giving you intermediary, purely gameplay goals not connected to the storyline. And if you think this is gone, you think that's an artifact of old times, you only have to play the newest Tomb Raider to recognize these little minigame sequences. And I say minigame the wrong way. Little side quest gathering collection things where she has to go find all the GPS caches. So, you know, the world is sort of in danger and uh, all of her friends are held hostage and maybe being tortured, but um, sure enough, she wanders around looking for GPS caches without much explanation for why. And it just helps highlight that we've never been able to really move away from this fact that if you only have the narrative impulse, that sort of overarching goal of save the princess, save the island, save the world, uh, you, you don't get as much really a sense of gameplay as you do when you have these little smaller objectives that are really just there for gameplay reasons. And we've all kind of waved be comfortable with sort of hand-waving away that we need those there for the game to kind of work for us, even if we don't call attention to it the same way that we may be used to. So the core values here, though, the high replay value, and immediate accessibility, and built off of very little content. And in these ways, they help, I think, set them apart from, from newer and other types of games. And these are actually idle, uh, ideals that returned in the uh, formation of the casual games market. So this is the game Peggle by PopCap. And uh, you shoot a ball from the top, it bounces down between these pegs or between the bricks, it lights them up and vanishes them. And it's very much a sort of a modern arcade take on Bagatelle, the game that predated Flippered Pinball. Uh, you get these, like you say here, this big message of radical, and you get all the, the spectacle of lights and sounds. And, and famously in this game, when you finish every level, you can get extreme fever and it freaks out and plays an overture and forms a rainbow and fireworks go off. And um, it's all about those dynamics that really help make an arcade game succeed with so little content. Because part of what made this casual market so fascinating to the rest of the AAA industry is that a game could have so little money spent on its, um, on say, 3D graphics or on a um, variety of huge architected 3D levels and still be so commercially successful. And here's a game where they really got a lot of mileage out of rearranging these basic elements in the same way that Pinball or these old games like Donkey Kong or Space Invaders or Galaga could make sort of more and more use out of relatively few elements and more or less kind of a static board. Now, Candlebolt is also a good example of a game which uh, thematically, so in gameplay it's maybe less like so except it is a, a button-based, one-button game. The thing about Candlebolt that's kind of like these old arcade games that revived it for the mobile market is the way that the story is such a static moment of the climax uh, without any real setup. I mean, the setup is kind of assumed, like you're crashing through windows, and there's a Swirsky interview with Adam Saltzman, the designer, in which he expresses that, like, this is basically just a game about you're just a guy running and jumping off rooftops and going crashing through windows, and, like, that's enough. That's cool. 
and whenever you fall off and die and go to your death, even if, you know, the game's wanting you to tweet it or whatever, it kind of, just like in the pinwall machines in Donkey Kong, doesn't really count. You're supposed to go right back into it and do it again and try to do it a little bit longer and further, but it's all about that cyclical, single moment uh, in which, again, the beginning is assumed or implied, and the ending either is impossible of the positive sense or doesn't really count in the negative sense. The other thing about these uh, pinball games, and uh, I mentioned this somewhat reluctantly, but it, I think it's necessary to acknowledge for some cultural context in addition to the sort of the gameplay studies, is that they are in many ways kind of an earlier example of problems in the uh, in the gender issues. And so uh, Anita Sarkisian, um, Sarkisian has, had a, has had a series recently about damsel in distress, and she shows how various uh, tropes have sort of been used against women in, in video game history, and she also traces these back to narrative traditions of old stories and epic tales and so on. But I think an additional uh, source of these problems have come from even just pinball games, where, as in the documentary Special When Lit, Pinball Hall of Fame owner Tim Arnold explains, the art, it's definitely something that's pitched towards young males. There's not really a lot of uh, female-friendly images on these. Part of the adolescent male fantasy is guns, women with large breasts, magic spells, any violent misogynistic thing you want is there on pinball. And so pinball machines, uh, maybe as much as early video games, are perhaps guilty of contributing to this, and I think it's something that maybe if we uh, pay some attention to why and think about um, how it fit into the market and history and so on, um, it may help us better understand the sources of some of these problems so we might better counteract them and see how things have hopefully changed since. And last but not least, the fact that these games were in so many ways designed around the fact they're paid for by quarters, their difficulty, their duration, their reusability, their replayability, their lack of narrative setup, um, their lack of completion, all these are dynamics that derive from the fact the game was played for by quarters, or in you know, earlier days, nickels, dimes, pennies. There's a sense to which, so even Pat Lawler, and also in Special with Lit, a uh, documentary explanation, they said that this is Pavlov. He straight up explained that, you know, the machine is rewarding you with sounds and lights when you're doing certain things, and you're supposed to become kind of addicted to it, so you'll just keep playing it because that's what's churning over their revenue. And I think the fact that this old game, um, and these old games like it, Donkey Kong, Space Invaders, Pac-Man, and so on, that are popular and idolized by an entire generation of players who grew up with them, I think this kind of implications on how we discuss newer games that are designed around economic incentives, in-app purchases, microtransactions, DLC, expansion packs, viral discovery, um, shareware or otherwise, other business-driven criteria, including anti-piracy measures or online subscription mechanisms that are supposed to help uh, keep people from pirating a game, when in many ways the, the older aesthetics, these older games we liked, so when we discuss things like Nintendo Hard, and it's something a lot of us grew up kind of having an affection for that Super Meat Boy capitalized on later, uh, Nintendo Hard is really defined in a lot of cases by those were games that were ported to Nintendo, um, home console and Nintendo Entertainment System, from the arcade designs. You know, if we look at the games that were specifically designed for Nintendo Entertainment System, many of them were not nearly so hard. You could actually beat them with enough persistence, as opposed to the games that really just tore the player down uh, and were extraordinarily difficult, punch out and otherwise. Many of them actually had coin-op arcade tradition history behind them that justified the Nintendo difficulty, or what's become famous since is Nintendo Hard, even though in many cases, again, these, these difficulties really originated in the arcades and found its way into the home through a Nintendo Entertainment System. So I think it's an important part of our discussion in, in microtransactions and in-app purchases and so on to look at, well, the other game dynamics we've liked have really evolved around different payment schemes, and maybe how does that affect our conversation um, besides just sort of being damning of the fact like, oh, it's trying to be addictive, well, so do these other games. Or it's trying to manipulate us into spending money, and so do these other games. So all these games have to get paid for somehow, uh, and there's different eras that have done this different ways, but just want to bring that back into the conversation as a closing point. And so thank you for taking time to listen. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as at Chris Delion, and you can find my game development blog at hobbygamedev.com. Uh, this is a, most of the sources seen in this uh, talk that I've been giving today. Uh, there are much more thorough sources listed in the actual thesis if you'd like to find that. You can go to tinyworld.com slash pinballthesis, which includes not only a far more comprehensive bibliography of all the sort of sources that I consulted in forming uh, and developing this line of thinking. In addition, it includes page numbers and times and videos if you'd like to look up specific references. Thanks so much for taking time to listen. Once again, I'm Chris Delion from Georgia Tech.